Back in 1944, my good friend at home, we decided to enlist in the Marines. And we were down to enlist. And he came from Germany when he was four years old and he didn't have a citizenship paper. So they wouldn't accept him. And they turned around later and drafted him in the army. Well, when I got in, I went through Leavenworth for my physical in Kansas and then went on to St. Louis and they needed three people to be moved over to the Navy Armed Guard, so I got moved to the Navy Armed Guard and went up to uh, Great Lakes for my training. That was in 1944. When I finished that, then I went to San Diego and learned radar. Uh, training, and then to Camp Pendleton, and then on to uh, San Francisco, Treasure Island, and then Brooklyn, New York, for the Naval Yards. Well, then I went with on a Liberty ship in the North Atlantic, and we hauled uh, troops, is what we did. And I was a radar man, and I'll never forget one experience that I had. I picked up the... Um, the St. Mary's, the um, British uh, liner at 30, uh, 30 miles, which was unusual for a radar because of the horizon, but it was a big ship. And you know, that ship, it hauled uh, troops too from the U.S. over to the Europe. And uh, surprisingly enough, they were fast enough, they didn't have to have escort because the submarines couldn't catch them. But we at nine knots, we were sitting ducks. Oh, there was times in there. I'll never forget down in Florida, I then got transferred down to Jacksonville Naval Hospital. And while I was down there, why, uh, they asked me if I could help them a little bit to give shots to some of the uh, patients there. I don't know what the shots were given for, but I did give some shots. I learned how to do it the proper way. And then while I was there, why one day, we uh, took and put one of our guys on a gurney, and we covered him over, and I went to the nurse and I said, uh, we have a patient here that's passed away that they want us to take him over to the mortuary. We don't know where that is. Can you help us? Well, she went out and she lifted the cover and saw he was sweating, so she knew he wasn't dead. But she played the game. She called two of the corpsmen over and they said, uh, she said, take this uh, uh, body over to the morgue. So one of them got in front and then he grabbed his hands back behind to pull it and the other guy was on the tail pushing it. The guy reached up and grabbed the guy's hand. <laughs> it just scared him to death. <laughs> well, I got out in 46 um, with the medical discharge. Mm -hmm. And then came back uh, to Nebraska and went to the university and graduated there with a degree in uh, agriculture and uh, technical science. I was a GI Bill of student, in, which was a wonderful program, which, you know, um, everybody in the Legion remembers that the past national commander from Kansas was the one that originated the bill and got it through. It was a great program for the veterans and I'm sure it was a big asset to the country as a whole. While I was in school, I was at the um, Delta Upsilon fraternity house. Um, we used to tell the story um, about that I was a th Theta Phi, I, um, let's see, uh, I fell to thigh. <laughs> well, anyway, 
I saw in the paper one day the mortuary was providing a free room for anybody that would stay there at their place of business. So I thought, well, that's a good deal. <clears throat> so I went down and I made application and they signed me right up. And the first day there, we went out and picked up a body and brought it back and they all left that night, left me there with the body. Well, in two days I left. That was enough for me. I, I didn't mind being with a body left alone, but not back when I was that young. My dad had been the commander of the post in our hometown. And when we came home, all the veterans in our community were given a free membership to the American Legion. And I was asked to be involved, and I got involved. And of course, I joined it in 1945 while I was still in the service. And then I uh, couldn't, when I was at the university, I didn't get involved until 1949 when I graduated. Then I got involved with the local post. One of the interesting things that we had, we had a doctor in our town that left and went to California. And we were without a doctor. And so, I was appointed to chair to build a clinic for a doctor. And we raised the money to build a clinic. And a surprising thing it was when it was completed, why I went down to the drugstore one day when one of the salespersons was coming through. And I asked him, I said, uh, would you inform me if you get around the country of a doctor that might be looking for a new place to go? And I, sure enough, within about three weeks, I had a telephone call. There's a doctor over in Iowa that might be interested. Well, I called the doctor and he said, you know, I was brought here by the local pharmacist he said, I don't know if I can leave or not. So I went to my attorney and I asked him, I said, what can I do? He said, go get a truck, go over and load him up at night. And so I did. I went over and loaded up his equipment and brought it back to our hometown. He was a veteran of World War II, a great guy. He came from South Dakota and just a wonderful person to have in our community, and the Legion was responsible for getting that done. I started out learning how to campaign in the state of Nebraska when I ran for senior vice commander and then on for commander. You had to go out and you had to work. You had to sell your ideas, and you had to sell how good the American Legion was. And that followed on up through as national vice commander and national commander. I had to have a committee and we had to raise money naturally because of the cost of, uh, of the campaign. And then I had to meet with the different regions and the districts throughout the country and answer their questions and, and work with them on what was the best for the American Legion. That's how it all got put together. When I was in Nebraska, I was chairman of the State Centennial Commission in 1967. I was appointed by uh, Governor Frank Morrison at the time. And then he appointed me to head up um, to see what we could do to improve our education system. And I was co-chairman for that. And I would travel the state and just go by districts and take the telephone book and just go through and pick out names at random. I didn't know who they were. Well, we finally got this thing put together and uh, we got all done with it and what it did was we changed the tax system in the state of Nebraska from a state property tax system to a state sales 
an income tax with 50% of the proceeds going to education. That was the greatest thing that ever happened in Nebraska. Well, out of that visits of the persons that I met, I met a fellow named a Father Paul Schwab from Ponca, Nebraska. He, had, uh, he was in charge of a church in town and one in the country. I found out he was a veteran. And uh, so I got him appointed as the state chaplain for the American Legion in Nebraska. Well, then after I was national commander, I got him elected as the national chaplain for the American Legion, Father Paul Schwab. Another thing that happened, I was in Cincinnati, Ohio one night at a Legion function. And I met a fellow named of Danny Scholl. He was a legionnaire. Danny Scholl was, uh, got hit uh, on a Jeep, got blown up on Guadalcanal. And he had 17 clamps in his brain. He was a singer. And his wife left him because she thought he wasn't going to survive. And so when our daughter was getting married in 1971 in Washington, D.C., they were going to this church, but the, the pastor there didn't want to marry them because they weren't members of that church. Well, we weren't residents there. Uh, so my daughter said, I'd like to have Father Paul Schwab perform the ceremony. So I said, all right. I called him, and he said, well, I'll have to have a special dispensation. And I said, no, it's going to be at the Navy Chapel on Nebraska Avenue. I said, uh, you won't have to have dispensation for that. So he came back, and he married him. I had Danny Scholl came in, and he sang. Well, Danny Scholl sang, and I've got the record, No Man is an Island. And I'll never forget that. Danny Scholl, I presented his to the, uh, when we had the Washington Conference in uh, March of my year as national commander. And uh, he came as the, the guest and, and uh, spoke. He told about his history and about his problems on Guadalcanal. And then he sang, No Man is an Island. There was not one dry eye among the members of Congress. I sat next to John McCormick and, uh, and Dirksen. And when he sang, there wasn't one dry eye. I presented his name to Agnew, who was vice president at the time, and he was in charge of presenting the award to the outstanding disabled for the year. Danny Scholl got the award. You know, in the Legion, we say for God and country. We've got to bring those words back to our school systems. When I went through our little old country school and our high school, we gave the Pledge of Allegiance every morning before we were in assembly, before our classes began. We had one minute to give our way of prayer. We've got to go back to that system to believe, to strengthen ourselves in our belief that America is important. America is a Christian nation. I don't care what kind of Christianity it is. It's a Christian nation. You know, after I served as national commander, I spent time on the uh, Freedom's Foundation in Pennsylvania. It was an interesting time because the role was to make a decision on what schools did the best job of teaching Americanism. Well, it was pretty easy to determine the best places were the parochial schools. 
because that was a background of Christianity. Christianity is important to us to become and stay as an American society. Well, let's see, when I was in uh, the convention in uh, New Orleans, I had a call uh, from the President Johnson at two o'clock in the morning asking if he could still come to our convention. He had to resign from it originally because he had another commitment. What year was that, sir? That was in 1968. And he resented one of his uh, partners gave a speech out in New Mexico, and the president resented that talk. So he came that in. Hubert Humphrey? That was Hubert Humphrey. And so the president came in uh, that d next morning, and he spoke without using any kind of a, um, a reading paper that the fellow can't do today. And uh, when, when he did this, he gave probably one of the best speeches he ever gave. And I'll never forget that, that he showed up and it was because of that. You know, the first time I met a president was in 1962. I was state commander in the American Legion in Nebraska and we were at a, um, commander's meeting back in Washington, D.C. It was when John Glenn came back from making the orbit, and he was at the Rose Garden, and I had a chance to go to the Rose Garden and meet John Glenn after that, at the invite of the president. The presidents have been pretty good to the American Legion. They've uh, followed them closely, they've uh, listened to them, and a lot of times they got knocked down because of the Congress, but, but they tried. They tried to follow the course that the American Legion is trying to lead, and it's important. I go over here uh, on a Friday night in my local area here to the KC Lodge, which is Knights of Columbus. Now, I was a master mason, but to show you back when I was in Nebraska, the, the Knights of Columbus invited me to be a speaker at their state meeting in Nebraska. And we discussed things. And you know, when I left, they said, you know, there isn't much difference between the two of us. And I said, that's right, there isn't much difference. But that's comradeship. That, that's what we're talking about. When I go over to the KC Lodge for fish on Friday night, I sit with fellows that were World War II, Marines, Navy, Air Force, and we all agree, Democrat, Republican, makes no difference, but we rejoice when we see each other coming in the door and we shake hands. We're comrades because we fought side by side. We believe in the same principles of God and country and our nation, and that's what makes comradeship uh, the number one priority in our organization in our other fraternal organizations, in our schools, in our government, by all means, we got to push more for what you brought up the question, better comrades. So I think we need to work with other groups. We need to uh, stay with, um, well, education to me is a key importance. We got to do a better job of training our young people. We got to work with parents. Parents are leaving from their role of trying to do a better job of supervising their children. I know that both of them are out, both of them working, a husband and wife, 
And, uh, and I applaud them for that. But they've got to give time to that child. We got to shut off the iPods a certain time of the day. We got to shut off TV certain times of the day, and especially some programs that are on that shouldn't be circulated among our young people. We've got to see some changes made. And I would hope that the American Legion would eyeball some of these things and work towards trying to get some corrections made and trying to uh, be an instrument to help rebuild a better, stronger America.